A sanctuary for terrorists. One year after America virtually handed Afghanistan over to the Taliban, al-Qaeda and ISIS have made Osama bin Laden's dream come true. U.S. intelligence has evidence that terror groups are already building training camps inside the country and that radical Islamists intend to launch attacks against the United States. George Thomas has the details. Florida Republican Congressman Mike Waltz, a decorated former Special Forces officer who led multiple combat tours to Afghanistan, tells CBN News that a year after the Taliban takeover, the country is now a sanctuary for terrorists. The intelligence community has been very clear to those of us on the Armed Services Committee that al-Qaeda and ISIS are rebuilding and they fully, fully intend to attack the West again. Afghan watchers say the Taliban achieved what Osama bin Laden dreamed of and ISIS wished for, a full-fledged caliphate with the powers of the state. With the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, these groups have been welcomed with open arms, even if quietly, and we've seen them reorganizing their efforts um, in Afghanistan. Congressman Walt says a year in, the consequences of America basically giving Afghanistan to the Taliban has meant a huge boost to militant Islamists everywhere. I can share with you that the United Nations uh, and their intelligence analysis uh, shows that 10 to 15,000 foreign fighters are now gravitating back into Afghanistan. In June, CENTCOM commander General Michael Carrilla revealed U.S. intelligence that terrorist groups like al-Qaeda are already building training camps inside the country. Uh, Al-Qaeda may or may not choose to launch attacks against the U.S., but the fact that it has the capacity, that it has the safe haven to do so, that is what frightens me. Indications are the Al-Qaeda-Taliban relationship is only getting stronger, as evidence that longtime Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri lived in a posh Kabul neighborhood until the August 2nd U.S. drone strike killed him at the safe house. The United Nations was reporting just weeks prior that top Al-Qaeda leaders were providing strategic guidance to the Taliban. And lo and behold, we kill Zawahiri in Kabul. I think this tells us everything we need to know about that Taliban-Al-Qaeda relationship. While Taliban fighters took to the streets this week celebrating the one-year anniversary of their takeover, most Afghans stayed home, dismayed at the crippling and harsh conditions under the Taliban's Islamic rule. It's been a year since Afghan girls set foot in a classroom. Sodaba Nazan decided to run informal classes at this undisclosed home in Kabul. The Taliban with its extreme ideology that they have against women have not changed. They are the same Taliban of 20 years ago, but we can't be the women of 20 years ago. We have to continue our struggle with the pen and our voices. Women are banned from government jobs, forbidden to travel alone, and have been ordered to cover up. Afghanistan as a whole is being denied the benefit of women and girls' contribution to society. Meanwhile, the country's economy is in tatters, and 97 percent of the population has fallen into poverty, with reports of widespread starvation. On the one hand, the economic situation is difficult. On the other hand, security situation is getting worse day by day. We still witness the same explosions and suicide attacks we used to witness in the past. A year under Taliban rule, and there's already talk of Afghanistan becoming a failed state. The future is, is very bleak. Uh, we see this as a precipice, and we are driving towards the precipice without even a safety belt on. In response to the Taliban harboring al-Zawahiri, the Biden administration is refusing to release $7 billion in Afghan funds under its control. While that denies funding to a government that supports terrorists, it could also intensify the looming humanitarian crisis. Andrew? George, thank you for your report. You know, what do you think of this? The administration says the fact that the U.S. killed al-Qaeda's leader in a drone strike in Kabul shows we can keep Afghanistan from becoming a terror base. But do you agree with that? Is that the case? Yeah, my, my question to the Biden administration is, do you know how many uh, Ayman al-Zawahiris there are today in Afghanistan? How many ISIS, al-Qaeda fighters, uh, are they tracking them? Look, we've been tracking uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri for 20-plus years, and when, once we found him, six 
months ago. We tracked him for six months and then did this uh, over the horizon, basically a drone strike uh, to take out one man. The experts say if that is the way to fight radical Islamic terrorism in Afghanistan, we're not going to be winning that battle. The truth of the matter uh, is that today, for the first time, Afghanistan uh, is welcoming uh, for, uh, the, the alphabet soup of terrorist organizations and fighters from around the world to come and converge uh, on this country to train, to recruit, be indoctrinated, and potentially uh, target the United States and our allies in the region. Well, George, your reporting showed us the courage of particular women. You know, for 20 years, the Afghan government worked to expand women's rights through access to education, work, even government posts. Is all that just gone now? Yeah, just a few days ago, right before the anniversary, Andrew, one of the ministers uh, in the Afghan government said that Afghanistan was not culturally ready to allow uh, Afghan girls to head back to school. What is culturally uh, ready to go back? In essence, it, it means uh, that the country is not uh, Islamist, is not, uh, you know, adhering to the principles of Sharia law that would protect uh, these girls from going uh, when they go to school. Uh, the reality, I think, what has changed so dramatically in just the last 20 years is that you've seen a generation of Afghan girls and women who have experienced a modicum of freedom uh, under the last 20 years of U.S. Uh, uh, involvement in the country. And today you see them going out on the streets just in the last 24, 48 hours, Andrew. They took to the streets demanding freedom, the access to health, the access to education. It's quite inspiring, something that you would have never seen, you know, 20, 25 years ago in Afghanistan. Today, a whole different generation has risen. Uh, but the question is, uh, will the heavy hand of the Taliban come down hard on these brave uh, women and girls? How about the Christian community in Afghanistan? It may be a small Christian community, but what's their situation? Are they underground? Yeah, Andrew, the, the, you know, we don't know the exact numbers. Uh, the estimates are that there are between 10,000 and 15,000 uh, Christians. A year ago, we heard reports that they were, in essence, escaping from the country, heading to, uh, heading to neighboring uh, Pakistan, to India, and to other countries in the region. The good news, my sources just talking to them uh, overnight, that they are still there. It has been a very difficult uh, path. Past year, they continue to work slowly, carefully, quietly, share the gospel. But you know, it reminds me of what happened in 1979 uh, in Iran when the Ayatollahs, the Mullahs, came to Iran and they took over. And all these years later, today, the fastest, where the place where Christianity is growing the fastest <coughs> is in, in Iran. And so those who are praying and praying for the Holy Spirit to continue to hover over the nation of Afghanistan are praying similarly uh, for the country that, uh, that the Lord would give them the strength that they need to continue ministering the good news of Jesus Christ in the midst of what seems to be some very, very difficult times ahead. All right, George, we always appreciate your reporting. Thanks for being with us today. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The tensions at the U.S.-Mexico border are on pace to shatter previous numbers. Governors in border states blame the Biden administration's policies, and they're taking matters into their own hands. As Washington correspondent Matt Galka reports, one radical tactic kicked off a feud with New York City's mayor. From buses to shipping containers, the governors of Texas and Arizona are using whatever they can to solve immigration problems in their states and to protest Joe Biden's immigration policies. This as the U.S. is on pace to top two million border arrests for the first time ever. Tractor trailers move shipping containers into position in Yuma, Arizona, as the state looked to fill a 1,000-foot gap in the border wall. The containers will be topped with razor wire. With Arizona Governor Doug Ducey tweeting last week, Arizona has had enough. We can't wait any longer. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is also feuding with the Biden administration. Both Ducey and Abbott have bussed migrants from their states to Washington, D.C. and New York City. Abbott doubled down on the move at the CPAC conference earlier this month. There are more buses on the way as we gather at this conference today. The move enraged New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who called the busing of asylum seekers horrific. It's unimaginable uh, that what uh, the governor of Texas has done. When you think about this country, a country that has always been open uh, to those who were fleeing uh, persecution and other uh, un 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 intolerable conditions. And this video from Texas highlights the state's feud with the president's border policies. 
The Texas National Guard had locked a gate at a crossing area. Border Patrol unlocked it to process migrants trying to get into the country. Abbott called it unbelievable. Border Patrol agents have made more than 1.8 million arrests this fiscal year. The number beats last year's record with two months to go. About 70% of the stops are single adults likely looking for work. The numbers come as the Biden administration has undone or rolled back some of the Trump-era immigration policies. The Remain in Mexico policy requiring asylum seekers to stay in Mexico until their court hearings is over. Title 42, a policy that denies migrants asylum because of the pandemic, remains in effect. The administration wants to end the program. They announced that back in April, uh, but a court has ordered that they keep it in place. So the administration uh, complies in a minimal fashion, uh, but they're not interested in, in such enforcement tools. Analysts believe that the numbers are partially and maybe surprisingly driven by Title 42, even though the policy is meant to turn people away at the border. Title 42 does not penalize people for repeated crossings. Border Patrol estimates that about one in four people have tried to enter the U.S. repeatedly over the past year. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Matt, thank you. The federal judge who approved the search warrant for former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home suggests he might make portions of the affidavit public. Judge Bruce Reinhardt has asked the Department of Justice to submit a redacted version of the document by next Thursday. The DOJ opposes making it public, claiming it could compromise the investigation and put witnesses at risk. Trump's legal team made no argument in the hearing. Once the redactions are submitted, the judge will review the document and make his decision. Turning now to the Middle East, a NATO nation estranged from Israel is now taking steps to restore that relationship by reestablishing full diplomatic ties with the Jewish state. Turkey is hoping to gain favor with the U.S. and the West. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. Turkey's foreign minister announced his country will renew full diplomatic relations with Israel. After the new government took office and Mr. Herzog was elected as president, a process of dialogue with Israel has started. He said his country will appoint an ambassador to Tel Aviv. One of his roles will be to help Turkey defend the rights of Palestinians. Israeli President Isaac Herzog tweeted that the move will encourage greater economic relations, mutual tourism and friendship between the Jewish and Turkish people, adding, good neighborly relations and the spirit of partnership in the Middle East are important for us all. Members of all faiths, Muslims, Jews and Christians can and must live together in peace. The two countries established diplomatic ties in 1949, but relations became strained under President Erdogan. Israel and Turkey had very warm relations before Recep Erdogan became the president of Turkey. The recent desire on Erdogan's part to renew relations with Israel, many believe comes as a result of Turkey's economy really floundering right now and his own popularity dipping as a result of that. CBN contributor Eli Kohanim says renewal of relations is meant to help Erdogan, but it's a benefit for both sides. It's certainly positive for Erdogan, again, because it does give him an economic lifeline, potentially, and brings him back into the embrace of Western countries. For Israel, Turkey is also an important partner in the region because Turkey is a NATO country. Dr. Galia Lindenstrauss says in the past, Israel needed relations with Turkey more than Turkey with Israel. But that's not the case now. Another issue on the agenda is the desire of Turkey to purchase F-16 jets from the United States. And there is hope that somehow the pro-Israel lobby will be more positive to uh, such a deal. Lyndon Strauss says Turkey needs Israel's natural gas and is moving towards normalization while a favorable government is in office. Israel wants to see Turkey cool its relations with Hamas. From the Israeli side, we know a major bone of contention between the two countries is the presence of Hamas military activities on Turkish soil. We know that this is something that Israel wants uh, Turkey to stop. According to Kohanim, the nearly two-year-old Abraham Accords between Israel and four Arab countries have had an impact. 
So we have a new region where Israel as a Jewish state is able to conduct full diplomatic and even military relations with its Muslim and Arab neighbors. And I do think that the Abraham Accords have certainly made it easier for Erdogan to join a growing list of Muslim countries that have ties to Israel. Kohanim says that while Erdogan's ultimate goal is to be the head of the Islamic world, the West hopes he'll continue to move towards moderation. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. And Terry, I'll send it back to you. Bareback riding on a bucking bronco. It was all in a day's work for Chad Rutherford. Until the day he fell and the horse stomped on his back, breaking eight of his ribs, cracking his collarbone, and collapsing his lung. Chad thought his career was over, but he was dead wrong. Few occupations are subjected to the jarring ups and downs like those above a rodeo floor and bucking broncos. Chad Rutherford has lived it. As one of the world's top bareback riders, he's overcome both professional and personal challenges with result. How do you describe your riding style? Aggressive. Very aggressive. And you're a competitor? Absolutely. At your core? Yes. So the two marry well together? in the most beautiful way possible. <laughs> For you, how much uncertainty comes with your profession as a bareback rider? There's nothing certain about being a bareback rider. Between entering the rodeo to the time the buzzer blows, there's no certainty in any of it. It's the biggest walk of faith I think you can have. So 2016, you finished 24th in the world. Then you go to Reno. What happened? When I showed up in Reno, 2017, I was sitting eighth in the world. And then tragedy hit, fell underneath my bucking horse, and he stepped on the middle of my back. I broke eight ribs in 13 places, cracked my collarbone and my shoulder blade, and collapsed alone. Spent a week in the hospital. All I could think was that, yep, my career's over. It's time to move on to the next step. Chat's next step was life altering. What came after was what really set in. Not a week after getting home, my wife at the time told me that she wanted to move out, that she didn't want to be married to me anymore. I was devastated. I went into a bad place, and I just felt this empty hole. I had no idea what to do. Not long after the divorce, I met my wife, Katie. And all I can describe her as is a godsend. Meeting her saved my life. I thank God every day for Katie. In those moments of desperation, what was the bounce back for you? It, it took a year or so. Putting the puzzle together and actually seeing that wreck in Reno was the greatest thing ever happened to me. That was God's way of grabbing me and saving my future and giving me the, the start I have today. How did a savior help you compete again? The aftermath of that injury was all the nerve damage I sustained. I was losing muscle mass in, on the right side of my body, which I ride with my right hand. After doing some extensive manual labor, I woke up one morning and the entire right side of my upper torso was sore. For me, it was a, a massive eye opener. I never thought I'd feel those muscles like that again. God was like, okay, you took the time you needed. We started training took a massive leap of faith. 2019 rolled around, I started entering some rodeos and it was just like I'd never stopped. I started winning again. Your sport is about fearlessness. What in your life are you afraid of that draws you to him for help? I, I would say fear itself is my biggest draw towards Christ. Fear of failure, fear of loss, fear of being left alone. I now know that I'm never alone as long as I have Christ. And he's always there. The older I get, the deeper I dig into Christ, the more I find just how great, how much he has taken care of me. Have you ever had to push away as if the sport has become too much? Absolutely. One of the biggest battles that rodeo cowboys face with rodeo is idolatry. We idolize rodeos. We idolize that gold buckle. We idolize the money we make. We idolize it so much that we sacrifice everything, friends, family. It's so easy to fall into that trap. I've got a wife and two kids right now, and I'm rodeoing the best way I think I can, putting God and my family first. 
So glorify him and love what you do. Who is Jesus Christ to you? What has he become for you? Jesus Christ to me has become the greatest friend I've ever had. He's the father that everyone wants. He should be your first thought when you need something. Lean on God, ask him for it, ask and he'll receive. You may not receive exactly what you want, but you will receive what you need. God's power in your life can make such a difference ask him for it. If you're in a desperate place in your own life for your own uh, personal reasons, ask God right into the middle of whatever the mess is, and he will be faithful to meet you right there and to walk through it with you. I want you to know we have a, a wonderful piece for you here called Faith, God's Power in Your Life. It is free, building your faith, God's word. What does he have to say? We want to get this to you. If you'd like it, if you're in need of it, call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I'd like that special piece on faith, and we'll get this out to you right away. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Drought in the southwest is threatening water supplies. Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the country, is down 130 feet and sits at only 27 percent capacity. Lake Powell, the second largest, is at 26 percent. Meanwhile, the Colorado River is in tier two water shortage. Forty million people in seven states and Mexico depend on its water, as well as a 15 billion dollar agricultural industry those states currently working on proposals to cut water consumption. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing clean water solutions to villages in Mexico and around the world. In this village in southern Mexico, some residents had to fetch water and store it in containers and tanks. Unfortunately, the water was not always clean, leading to stomach pains, diarrhea, and fever. That's when Operation Blessing stepped in, providing a new water system, including needed supplies as well as pipes and chlorination. It also offered workshops on hand washing and other good hygiene habits. These families now are thankful for clean water and for better health. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. All right, too macho or maybe too soft? That's the dilemma men face in our culture. So what's a guy to do to be a better man? Pastor Chase Rep. Logel has written a guide to answer that question. It's open season on masculinity. Society continues to call out what's wrong with men without showing them how to be better. The result? Men are conflicted between who they are internally and how they're expected to behave externally. In his book, The Five Masculine Instincts, author and pastor Chase Rep. Logel shares how men can navigate the culture war in redefining masculinity without losing their identity. It's a great book. I just finished it. Pastor Chase joins us now. Pastor, you made me laugh on page one because the book is about masculinity, and you say on the first page you're tired of talking about masculinity. So, <laughs> how does that start the book? So, why would you write a book on it? Like you probably as well, I've witnessed over the last few years how the word itself, masculinity, has become really in many ways controversial. You know, I'm, I have a congregation full of men. I'm raising a son. I know you've got sons. And I've seen the way that it's become in some ways risky to talk about it, yeah. particularly in public. Uh, I think people are avoiding conversations around manhood and masculinity. And so what I wanted the book to be was not just another voice contributing to the same positions, yeah. the same trenches we've already dug, but to try to provide men a way forward to grow in character, to grow in Christ-likeness that actually moves that conversation, helps men move forward. Because the truth is, a lot of us are just avoiding the conversation, even mm -hmm. as men, because it feels controversial or risky. Yeah, and men have instincts natural to us. I mean, women do too, but men particular instincts. How do we balance what those instincts may be? Or uh, you can describe what an instinct is in your own way, but how do we balance that with the truth of the gospel? Sure, so I use C.S. Lewis's definition of instincts as behavior as if from knowledge. So there are certain things in our lives that lead us to act that sometimes we're not aware of driving that behavior. And a part of growing like Christ, becoming like Christ, is maturing to start to ask better questions about why you do the things you mm -hmm. do. It's not just enough to say, why do I sin in this particular way? But what's motivating that? And so really the conversation around instincts is a question about what as men is driving us towards the behavior. Sometimes good things that get out of control, we lose perspective on, that can actually lead us to really destructive places. You know, Jesus talked about meekness 
And that's something I don't think anybody wants because meek sounds like weak. So when we read that we are to be meek or it's an admirable trait to have, people, I don't know if people are really interested in it. Your book took on meekness in a form I've never seen. Talk about that. Yeah, well, it is. We're in a political season, and you will certainly see no politician with meekness on their yard signs. Yeah. It's not a quality that we want for ourselves. But it is by the way the New Testament presents it, and even how the word's used in ancient Greek, it's a kind of strength. It's a kind of strength that has internal control. So the idea of meekness sometimes will be used to describe war horses in ancient Greek culture, that a, a war horse has to maintain some of its wildness, its power, its strength. But that strength has to be brought under control. It has to be disciplined. So really the value of meekness is you have the kind of strength that can absorb a blow, that can absorb a wrong, that can be criticized, and you're not so immature that you need to immediately respond, but you can control what you're experiencing consider what God might be doing in that moment and respond in a more Christ-like way. So in that illustration, are we the horse or are we the rider? That's one of the things I write in the book that we all like to imagine we're the one riding off into the sunset. But I think the way scripture presents it is we're more the horse that's coming under the control of the rider, which is the spirit, God leading us in the direction he would have us to go. And part of our task as men is cultivating that meekness to begin to recognize the subtle tugs of the rain or his knee in our side that moves us in a new direction. I talked to Christian business people or, or just Christian guys in general, and they say, you know, I'm a competitive person. I like to be aggressive. I have ambitions. Is that okay in the Christian life? I mean, yes, it is. But talk about that balance we need to have. Well, a big part of what I try to do in the book is say there are good things that can become too important to us. And ambition is certainly one of those. The last thing I would say is we need a generation of ambitionless men. You know, we want men to have ambition, but we want that ambition to be able to be checked by God. So I write about Sabbath as a tool of checking ambition and keeping it in its proper place. So for all of the instincts, what I hope men are learning from the book is a way of evaluating how that instincts at work within them how it can be used for good, but how also through faith they can check that instinct and make sure it stays in its proper God-given place. So here is a destructive thing in anyone's life, and that is apathy. Apathy, man, woman, whoever. When we become apathetic, it's destructive. I write about uh, the character of Abraham with apathy and that I think one of Abraham's most dangerous moments is the end of chapter 21 of Genesis where everything seems to have finally happened for him. He's settled in peace. He signed peace treaties. Isaac is finally there. It seems like his sort of retirement days. But you turn the page into Genesis 22 and you read, but God tested Abraham. And of course, that pivotal moment in his life where he's called to sacrifice Isaac, God intervenes. He should have been done with tests by then. Well, you would think he's past it, past yeah. all of them, right? But instead, God keeps him alive to faith, wakes him back up to faith. He won't let Abraham's life slip into a kind of apathy that robs him of that character that really is so central to him. He is the father of faith. And God, by his tests, even late in life, keeps that faith engaged out of apathy. I had never seen a book about scripture with talking about sarcasm. How does that fit into this? So I do. One of the instincts that I cover in the book is sarcasm with the story of Cain. Uh, you might remember his reference to God. Uh, Am I my brother's keeper? This moment, he knows exactly where his brother is. He's murdered him. And so one of the things men can, particularly young men, can struggle with is mm -hmm. to take things seriously. Everything's a joke. We use sarcasm and humor as a way of ridding ourselves of responsibility. And again, it's one of these instincts that can actually be driving dangerous, destructive behavior if we're not aware that it's going on. A lot of men have masks on and we're more concerned about a reputation than anything. Is there a problem with that? I use David to talk about reputation. Again, reputation can be a really good thing. And the Bible encourages us to have a good reputation. It's one of the qualifications for leadership. But it can become a, an instinct that leads us to start manipulating our public appearance, to over-concerning ourselves with how we're seen in public, to hide things within our life and that persona we present. And so like we see in David's life, at times his strength is integrity, and at times that integrity gets violated in some pretty destructive ways. Yeah. It's a great book. I encourage you all to pick it up. Chase's guide is, uh, excuse me, the book is called The Five Masculine Instincts, and it was a great read. I really do encourage you to get it, uh, especially for sons, too. It's a, it's a great path to be on. Available wherever books are sold. Chase, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Appreciate it. Terry, over to you. Becky watches the 700 Club every day. She's seen stories of people being helped all around the world. But it was after her house was flooded by a major storm that Becky got a first-hand look at your gifts in action. I was afraid and I wanted to get out. I didn't know how high the water was going to get. 
Becky and her husband, Gary, were jolted awake by the sound of their neighbors banging on the door. Beaumont, Texas was being flooded by rain from Tropical Storm Imelda. As they left the house, memories of Hurricane Harvey haunted Becky. And I kept thinking, we got to get out of here because it's going to be the same way. And we didn't want to have to be rescued in a boat. And we didn't want to have to go to a shelter. I had a stroke after Harvey, all the stress. Thankfully, they drove to safety themselves and rode out the storm in an RV. Days later, when Becky returned to the house, she was heartbroken to discover her walls had been soaked again. You have to tear them out and replace them. I'm old and my health is not as good and I couldn't, I would be ready to walk away and never come back. Becky's cousin knew Operation Blessing was in Beaumont during Harvey. She told Becky we came back again to help families recover after Imelda. And before the day was over, you were here. And today you're here. God is taking care of me. He is taking care of me. He is taking care of me. Our crew of volunteers cut out the water-soaked drywall and removed the wet insulation before mold had a chance to set in. Then we hauled all that debris out to the road. We found out Becky has been a 700 Club partner for years. She was overjoyed when CBN's Operation Blessing came to her rescue. I watch it every day on TV, and I know they do great things for people everywhere. People that aren't as blessed as we are, because they don't have water and they don't have things that we take for granted. Thank you for everybody that gives. So Operation Blessing can go and help other people. And now I know they came and helped me. And I don't know what I would do without y'all. Well, you can feel her grief, can't you, having gone through that once before? And then even though she and her husband were able to drive away to safety, you know that on their minds the whole time is, what are we going to go back to? You know, I hear it said so many times by people who are like Becky and her husband, 700 Club members, talk about how they watch the stories of Operation Blessing in this country, that country, even somewhere in the United States. But then when disaster strikes and those trucks pull into your community with Operation Blessing across the side of them, you know that it means hope and help and that they're going to stay until the job is done. That's just one of the things that you do when you join the 700 Club. You know, tomorrow it may be somewhere in a third world country, but the day after it might be you. We want to say thank you for joining the 700 Club because it means we bring hope and light into some very dark places for people. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and that makes you a rescuer. You show up in the hardest of places. But there are other club options as well. You can see it there before you. If you're already a 700 Club member, would you go up to 700 Club Gold? That's a gift of $40 a month. Or join the 1000 Club at $84 a month. You can see our 2500 Club members join us at $209 a month. And then we call them founders. They give gifts of $5,000 or more a year, and that rounds out to $417 a month. Do something to make a difference, because you don't know whether tomorrow those trucks are going to be needed in your community or not. But what you can know is every Every day, you're touching somebody's place of need. Listen, when you call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to join the 700 Club, will you also add, I'd like to do it using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. I personally love it. It means your bank does all the work. You don't need envelopes, stamps, or even to remember. It's all done for you. You can stop it whenever you like. But it does save us some administrative costs so we can put even more of your gift right into the need of people like Becky. When you do use Pledge Express, we're going to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every month. And because you're joining the 700 Club today, we want to send you Putting on the Armor of God. It's Pat's latest teaching on the book of Ephesians. It's all yours when you join the 700 Club. Andrew? Stephen Mask was playing football when he suddenly collapsed. He was foaming at the mouth. He was clammy and cold. He was in full cardiac arrest, and before long, he was dead. On September 21st, 2011, Tammy Mask got a devastating phone call about her 20-year-old son, Stephen. 
My sister-in-law was like, meet us at the hospital. Um, Stephen has collapsed. I didn't realize it was that bad. I didn't realize that he had actually died. Earlier that day, Stephen got together with friends for a pickup football game at their high school alma mater in Lufkin, Texas. In the middle of a play, Stephen fell suddenly face first on the field. Everybody ran over there to him. We turned him over slowly. He was foaming out the side of his mouth. Luckily, Miss Jewel, she was a nurse. She was over there walking around in the track. And as I was on my way over, I kept thinking, Lord, please let him be okay. He was cold and he was clammy and I kept doing compressions. The panic, it was real. Jewel Randall continued CPR until paramedics arrived and found Stephen in full cardiac arrest. On the way to the hospital, they got a pulse. They took me to the room where Stephen was and he was hooked up to all these machines. I just started begging God not to take my child, to take my life instead. But doctors said there was nothing more they could do for her son. He was life lighted to Houston Methodist Hospital, where a team of physicians were ready. Dr. Masrur Khan was Stephen's cardiologist. He was comatose. He was intubated. He had a breathing tube, and he was on some drips to get him going. Doctors determined Stephen had been clinically dead without oxygen and a heartbeat for over 20 minutes. Stephen's heart was enlarged and nearly 90% of his brain was severely damaged. If he survived, doctors said he would be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. It's like someone is just stabbing, you know, you've been stabbed in your heart. You know, that's your baby laying there. It was very tough to see him hooked up to all kinds of wires and machine, you know, and monitors. It was just devastating, but I had faith that he would recover. With no time to waste, the Mask family called on their church, family, and community for prayers and support. Three days went by with no sign of progress. Stephen developed a staph infection in his lungs, but Tammy and her family didn't give up. Um, I felt as if God wanted us to fast, so I, I asked everyone on Facebook, to, would they please fast and pray for Stephen, that God would spare his life, and not only spare his life, but restore him, make him whole. And that's when God just started working one miracle after another. After only a day of fasting for Stephen, his lung infection cleared up, and Stephen came out of the coma. I was just so, just grateful, just thankful. Just a, a feeling of gratitude and thankfulness to Jesus. By day three of the fast, doctors said his heart was returning to its normal size and functioning at 80%. The doctors, they were like, we don't know what to say. We cannot explain this. His heart is fine. They said, we can't explain it. And I kept saying, it's God. Eventually, doctors performed heart surgery to implant a defibrillator. Then, on October 15, 2011, Stephen was released to begin rehab. Soon, he was speaking. He said, where is Bree, his sister, because I was really, really close. And so when he started talking, that was actually his first words. Any little progress he made writing his name, even though he, he would write his name backwards, he had to learn to brush his teeth, he had to learn to do everything. Every step he made was like, it was joy. On November 18th, 2011, nearly two months after his heart attack, Stephen went home. Oh, wow, it felt so good. Because he had been there for 55 days just to have him home and we can take care of him. So as a family, we work to, to try to help Stephen get to where he needs to be. Stephen doesn't remember what happened that day on the football field, but one part of his recovery is unforgettable. I remember a few of my friends and close friends and classmates, family, all in the hospital in my room praying for me. It made me feel loved. Stephen continued to make steady progress while undergoing therapy for speech and memory. Although he still faces some challenges, Tammy says he is fully functional. They share more of his testimony in their book called Another Slam Dunk. He's the greatest. He was able to heal me like I'm just a new person that's been put on this earth. The power of prayer is real. He wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for God. I know God answers prayer. Prayer works. Prayer works. He wants us to trust him. 
even when you can't you can't see it, it doesn't look good. All he wants us to do is trust him and have faith. We have the privilege on this program of sharing stories with you about how God interceded in a person or a family situation and prayer was so vital to it. And it's always an encouragement to see what God has done. And, and uh, Stephen, you're a courageous, brave man, and we thank the Lord for what he's done in your life. You have a need today, perhaps. Terry and I want to pray for you, and we're going to do so. Before we do, we'd like to share a couple more encouraging reports. We heard from Shirley from Elko, Georgia. She had an issue with the ribs and lungs that caused her to take very shallow breaths. And she was watching this program. She heard Terry say, someone, you have a condition in the lobe of one of your lungs, and it's some kind of infection. God's healing that for you. And all the problems you've been having will be gone with that healing. Receive it. Exercising her faith, Shirley believed, and her lungs can now fully expand, and her breathing has relaxed. That's wonderful. Yes, God, that is wonderful. Well, this is Lauren. She wrote by email, I woke up with my tonsils excruciatingly painful and inflamed. I cried out to Jesus as I was unable to eat, and it was difficult to swallow liquids. On August 11th, during my daily viewing of the 700 Club, Andrew had a word that someone was having trouble eating, that their throat was so tender and raw, even consuming liquids was extremely painful. I put my hand on my throat at his encouragement and claimed the healing that Andrew proclaimed. Immediately, I was able to swallow more comfortably and felt a popping sensation. By that night, I was drinking, eating, and swallowing without suffering. Praise God. Amen. Lord, we're just thankful for what you're doing and that people are letting us know. We love to hear from you. We love to see and hear what God does. Let's pray now for whatever your concern is, okay? Join with us in prayer. Father God, we just come before you, Terry and I do, on behalf of the audience. And there are many, many praying for each other now through all those watching this program. And we thank you that we are exercising our faith and mostly just to be at your feet and say, we want to make time for you. We honor you, Lord. And we thank you now that your Holy Spirit, we ask you to move on behalf of people in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. There is, Terry, if I may, I just see a, a, and hear a woman crying, you're just so scared about your child going off to college. And you're, you're literally at this moment getting it ready. And just, you're so tenderhearted about this and scared. And the Lord just would say to you, I have this dear one to you. I have this dear one. Your many, many years of prayer have been heard. Just feel and experience the peace God has for you now, Mom, in Jesus' name. There's someone else you desperately need a healing for. I, I think it's called psoriatic arthritis. It's um, not only incredibly painful and therefore making your life very difficult, it's also unsightly. And so God is healing that condition for you. Wherever you are experiencing that right now, put your hand there. Lord God, we just declare your healing power over the entire body of this person from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes. Set them free. In Jesus' name we pray. We keep our eyes on the Lord. With him at our right hand, we will not be shaken. That, that's Psalm 16, and I just think the Lord wants to speak that over us today. With him at our right hand, we will not be shaken shaken. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. We can stop living in a spirit of defeat. Jesus has overcome the world. Lord, we thank you for victory through the cross. And there's also a mom. You have a son with some learning challenges, um, just a hard time keeping up with everybody else, and you're so concerned about him going back to school. God is providing for you someone within the system who's going to be just the catalyst that turns this learning thing around for your son. Just go with a peaceful heart and a peaceful mind and know that God's already taken care of this. He's in your tomorrow. It's done in Jesus' name. Somebody with a deep piercing pain on their right side, and it's extremely painful and sharp. And you're going to now experience a healing thanks to what the Lord wants to do in your life. Just raise your hands and receive that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you're moving. Someone else, you have a, emotional issues, like deep emotional issues from past relationship with your dad when you were quite young. God's healing that for you right now. Just put your hand on your heart. Mm. Jesus, we just declare freedom and wholeness in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for praying with us. We want to leave you with these words from Jeremiah. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God bless you.